as you, of course, all know, um, after nearly a month, uh, Israel has responded to Iran, Iran's attacks on um, on military installations in Tel Aviv and around Tel Aviv in Israel. Um, and I saw this quick snippet from the Atlantic Council, which I wanted to highlight to you. Uh, the Atlantic Council being the uh, de facto think tank of NATO. Um, and this just, I just wanted to highlight the sentence here because this is hilarious to me. It seems that in response to U.S. government requests and in, and in an attempt to contain the escalation, Israel focused on military sites only. The initial plan was just to bomb every hospital, of course. Um, yes. Presumably, uh, they heard there's gold underneath. So, you know. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think that's uh, very illustrative of uh, the Israeli style of warfare is just like going for civilian infrastructure. I think there were there were rumors for a long time that um, the uh, Iranian oil facilities would be the primary target. Um, a uh, a scene. This is via the BBC, a senior. U.S. administration official had said that uh, the U.S. had worked to encourage, quote, targeted and proportional response. The extent of the attacks and the damage caused remains unclear at this stage. The IDF said it hit around 20 targets, including missile manufacturing facilities, surface-to-air missiles, and other military sites. The Iranian military confirmed that four soldiers had died while two, uh, two quote, while batting, battling projectiles. Iranian authorities said sites in Tehran, Khuzestan and Ilam, forgive me if I'm butchering those pronunciations, were, <laughs> were targeted. The country's air defense said that it had successfully intercepted attacks, but that some areas sustained limited damage. BBC Verify has identified damage at defense ministry base at a defense ministry base to the east of Tehran and a, an air defense base to the south. So that's via the BBC. Um, it seems to me that the uh the response was uh quite limited. Um, mm. given what we've come to expect from Israel, I mean, um, their, their unprovoked responses, uh, you know, just wipe out areas, cause mass, mass yeah. casualties. Um, so, so this, uh, this was, um, I don't want to say measured, uh, but <laughs> I think that they, there was some Maybe measuring. Maybe. No, I think there was some measuring that happened because, uh, obviously this was a situation which could have easily uh, gotten out of hand. And I think that um, in many ways, this attack shows cowardice, right? Uh, cowardice, uh, because they know they cannot win a war against Iran, Ansarallah, against Hezbollah, against Syria, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and, and I'm guessing the, that the U.S. probably said, we will not back you up. Um, and so that's why this was so limited. That's that's my opinion. I don't know if you have any any kind of thoughts on that. <clears throat> yeah, sure. So I mean, I think that like that basically that actually, I mean, as we've discussed on the show before, that that when uh, Iran carried out its October first strike, which was like pretty spectacular, and there are all these, there's all this footage, including footage shot by our, our dear friend. Um, and and collaborator Jer uh, Jeremy Lafredo, um, who spent the best part of a week in an Israeli dungeon um, for his fearless investigative reporting. Yeah, the the the, the, the Iran um, on October first struck uh, Israel like pretty severely, and they did so without any pushback from Israel's much vaunted uh, air defense and missile defense systems, um, and <clears throat> they have made clear that. Um, further retaliations would lead to even worse um, uh, strikes um, upon Israel. Um, there was a lot of hype. I I got um, attacked by a lot of um, Zionists on on Twitter. So that's what they what they do, um, warning me that well that you know there's a major Israeli attacking coming. Um, there there were some astonishing tweets like collated from in Hebrew um, posted by hardcore Zionists who were um, bemoaning how pathetic this uh, quote unquote response was from. Uh, uh, from uh, Israel. Um, I think this is the extent 
of what they could pull off without leading to a wider war. And given how modest it was, um, this should this should tell us something about like the limits of Israeli power, military power um, it, um, in the here and now. Um, that the, 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 they knew that if they, um, I mean, to the extent they even could um, uh, the, the respond in a, in a very, very, very aggressive way, that this would lead to all-out war, which uh, Iran was likely to win. We discussed on previous active measure shows, there are official reports published by Zionist think tanks and um, uh, you know, major um, uh, centers of imperial power Imperial fora, we, we, we might call them, which effectively state that, well, OK, so the US is not prepared for war with Iran. Um, I think that's where the US pushback comes from. They know that um, if if Israel, again, in the event they even could, which is doubtful, um, stage something like really significant and seismic, that the Islamic Republic would respond um, far more brutally and devastatingly. Um, so, uh, I mean, some of the some of the cope on this initially was quite interesting with suggestions that Israel attacked lightly in order to um, give Iran um, the leeway to claim that nothing had happened. Um, so, I mean, it does beg the question of why would you respond at all? But I mean, I think that the, the I mean, the answer to that um, in real terms from Israel's perspective is they needed to do something because they'd hyped up. A counter yeah. response to such a degree that if they didn't do anything, that that might um, be fatal to to their perception of power. Although I don't think that that perception is there anymore. Anyway, you know, like, like I mean, yeah. I, I think this is this is the extent of what they could do. It was extremely. Uh, it was it was piss poor actually. Um, uh, as far as responses go, it was. But as I say, it was dunked on by Zionists themselves. Um, and I also think that, I mean, I've included this in the show notes, Alex, that like there were, it was quite, it seemed quite clear to me, at least, that the, there were people within the power structure who were trying to diminish um, uh, in advance expectations for what might happen. Now, um, you have up on up on screen a tweet from someone um, it's it, it's from a, one of those those, those OSINT accounts um, stating that an Israeli MP says a leak of um, sensitive U.S. documents, which pointed to the nature of the U.S. response to Israel, um, uh, meant that uh, Israel couldn't attack Iran, and this was deliberate. Um, I think the leak was deliberate. I think this is targeted. Um, I think that the documents are put out there to give the Zionist entity an excuse for why they couldn't savagely attack Iran, when the reality is that they literally can't. They can't do it uh, because of the gravity of the situation in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, and this, of course, uh, comes with much dismay for the media class. There's this great article by Greg Shupak in Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting. It's a mm. Wonderful resource for um, de debunking the mainstream media and their their narratives on foreign policy. I suggest everyone follows this, this publication. Um, but there's a number. What this article does is it it showcases some of the quotes uh, that were published as guest essays or as op eds or even op eds by the, for example, the Wall Street editorial board. Um, which were basically unanimous in calling for Israel to retaliate by attacking Iranian uh, Iran's nuclear program. So mm. I'm just going to leave the uh, display where it is, but I'll I'll read some of these highlights again from from Fair um, Gregory Shupak. Um, this is Brett Stevens in the New York Times in an article entitled. Actually, we absolutely do need to escalate in Iran. And this is the quote. There needs to be a direct and unmistakable American response. Iran currently produces many of its missiles at the Ifshahan military com uh, missile complex. At a mi minimum, Biden sh should order it destroyed as a direct and por 
um, proportionate response to its aggression. There is a uranium enrichment site near Ifshahan as well, or two. Um, the Wall Street Journal editorial board wrote that Iran's October 1 operation against Israel, quote, warrants a response targeting Iran's military and nuclear assets. The editor of the Wall Street Journal, cont uh, the editors contended, if there was ever a cause to target Iran's nuclear facilities, the attack is it. Iran is closer than ever to a nuclear weapon and won't stop itself. The question for American and Israeli leaders is, if not now, when? And then the LA Times published two guest op-eds in less than two weeks urging attacks on Iran Iran based on its alleged nuclear threat. Uh, the second one, here's a quote from it. With Iran's belligerence and overdrive, the U.S. and its allies should seriously consider a military option to take out Iran's nuclear sites. So it appears that the chicken hawks of the, of the mainstream media class did not get what they want. Um, Israel has, for now, averted a regional war, which they would lose. Um, mm. I think that uh, I saw a quote from Trita Parsi. Uh, I think he's the executive director of the uh, of of uh, responsible statecraft, um, which is affiliated with the Quincy Institute. It's a it's a DC based think tank that, um, well, they they take a pretty measured line on and are generally pro-peace, um, not not of the same class of think tanks as like the Atlantic Council or all these other publications. But he he uh, said that, you know, like this is averted a regional war for now. Maybe Iran doesn't feel that it needs to respond to this response. Uh, mm. Maybe it does. But at the end of the day, as long as the slaughter continues in Gaza and Lebanon, uh, it could be a couple weeks it could be a few months but this will happen again there will be a, an iranian response to israeli slaughter israel will respond will, will, and will, israel will have to figure out how to respond so at the end of the day um while uh for now the the risk of escalation has been neutralized uh it remains as long as israel continues to conduct this um slaughter yeah yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, also as well, it's like, you've got to bear in mind that like Israel is losing badly now in Lebanon to the extent that like the mainstream media is like actually acknowledging it. Um, it's it, 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 it's a very messy operation for Israel to be operating in Hezbollah's territory, um, which they you know know very well, um, <laughs> etc. And I think that, yeah, the, the, the entire purpose of Netanyahu's folly here is to get the US involved and they have so far shown actually beyond sending a token aircraft carrier to the to West Asia they have shown very little appetite for escalation um as we'll get into later um there are indications that they can't sustain anything more than than what Israel is doing now which is yes slaughtering Palestinians on an industrial scale and that's horrific um but at the same time um in terms of like a serious like military um uh engagement um neither the zionist entity nor its anglo-saxon backers are actually up to the task now because they don't have the mil missile stockpiles they don't have the bomb stockpiles they, they don't have the muscle or um the the, the power they once did um, and so, yeah, um, the, I mean, um, as again, as Alex and I have dis discussed on past episodes and you know, we'll, we'll continue to discuss it because it's um, of vital importance, um, the empire is basically finished in the Middle East. Like, um, yes, there are still puppet governments who are willing to, which are willing to allow Israel to use their airspace. There are still um, people on the ground who um, are paid off uh or uh, one way or another manipulated um into thinking that um <clears throat> the, the the status quo as it existed pre-october 7th 2023 um when hamas uh carried out the the rather epic um operation al -Aqsa flood who think that everything's going to go back to normal and that this is a preferable state of affairs no um actually this is uh the birthing pains of something very very different um so 
Yeah, um, I mean, and we look at other uh, developments like in the region um, at the moment. So like um, if you bring it up on screen, screen Alex, um, Iran and Saudi Arabia are going to hold joint naval exercises in the Sea of Oman. Um, this is a you know a body of water next to a, um, a British created dictatorship um, in Oman, um, which they, they they fought they fought over very brutally um, uh, following World War Two. Um, yeah, the, the the Saudi Arabia and Iran are willing to carry out this 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 jo yeah this joint naval exercise. Um, a lot of people might think, well, um, you can't trust the Saudis. Uh, that's yeah fair. Um, they are snakes of the highest order. To say nothing of you know like publicly executing people for infidelity and homosexuality. But at the same time, um, you know the, I, I think this development speaks to the fact that Iran and Saudi Arabia have come to some kind of um, concord um, in terms of their international dealings. Um, it's quite evident that like Saudi Arabia understands the winds, um, the geopolitical winds are blowing in different directions now. Um, that, uh, it, you know, yeah, like, I mean, I spent most of my my years in journalism, like initially, writing about effectively the Iran-Saudi Arabia regional proxy war, whether that's in Yemen, where um, an Ara the, the Iranian-backed Ansarallah fought, like, withstood a almost 10-year genocidal battering from US and British uh, equipped, trained, armed uh, uh, fighter jets that were like raining down death and destruction from the Monfar. Um, that, the, yeah, the, I mean, this was Im unimaginable um, two years ago, a year yeah. ago, six months ago. Like, this is hugely significant. Like, the fact that it's happening at all is highly representative. And um, the fact that, that equally this is getting zero like mainstream media coverage should tell us that, like, Actually, the CIA, which dictates the overwhelming majority of the mainstream media's coverage of issues, has no real response to this. Yeah, well, I remember uh, the surprise that relations had been normalized. This was yeah. not normalized, but uh, eased um, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And uh, the CIA director at the time took an emergency trip to Riyadh to, to try to quash it. Um, this yeah. was a this was an agreement which was brokered in secret by China, which was a uh, major. It, it was a watershed moment in terms of Chinese international uh, diplomacy um, and the Chinese's ability to uh, to 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 be a mediator. Um, I don't think that we'd ever really seen anything like that before. Um, right. And you know, yeah, I I don't think you or I were raised in an era where uh, anti-war people or uh, enlightened people, progressive people, uh, had any love for Saudi Arabia. Um, mm. I'm not suggesting that the kingdom <laughs> has fundamentally changed, um, mm. but let me twiddle my mustache for a bit and just use the word real politic, you know, um, because that's really what's, what's going on here. And um, it is a net positive. So one excerpt from this article that I want to highlight is uh, Saudi Arabia, which has helped Israel fend off Iran's barrage in April, sealed off its airspace as a route for Israel's response, according to three Gulf sources cited by Reuters. So they blocked Iran's attacks on Israel, but then also refused to allow Israel to use its airspace to respond. Um, yeah. An Iranian official told the agency that Tehran had warned Saudi Arabia it could not guarantee the safety of Saudi oil facilities if Israel goes through with a reported plan to strike oil facilities in Iran. Um, so that seems to be, uh, I, I think that um, leaders want uh, stability and economic prosperity because that's their ticket to staying in leadership positions, right? If 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 the if the economy is good, there's no there's very little upheaval, social upheaval, um, and you basically get to stay in power for however long you want. Um, and so, yeah, you you hit the nail on the head that uh, Saudi sees Saudi Arabia sees which way the wind is blowing, and has decided to um, to make a, make peace with Iran, to work with China, to work with all these allies. 
of uh, Washington, which has traditionally been uh, really its only ally. Um, hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I, th I think as well. I think as well that, like, I mean, this 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 cuts back many decades to when, um, on the deck of a um, uh, Saudi oil freighter, uh, FDR Frank Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the U.S. president at the time, cut a deal with um, the he the head of Saudi Arabia. Um, where they, I mean, they smoked cigars together, and they they talked about how the U.S. would always um, uh, provide security support and backing to the House of Saud. Um, like, and then you know, the the, the U.S. has made um, since the genocide in Gaza began has made um, or attempted to make um, recognition of Israel. Um, uh, a central component of their continued backing for um, for Riyadh for like for, for the, like the House of Saud, um, and uh, the, the the mere fact that the that Saudi Arabia would engage in this um, joint naval exercise with Iran suggests that yeah that they they kind of at the very least they understand that there is a risk of the U.S. empire not being the only game in town. Um, I would suggest it, it goes a lot deeper that the that the, the, the Riyadh understands that, well, we're in a multipolar world now. And um, actually, uh, the yeah, the, 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 it is a better bet to side with the resistance because there is a high likelihood the resistance will win. Again, Alex and I have discussed some previous shows. Um, the, 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 the balance in power in West Asia has shifted irrevocably the u.s does not have the wealth or the muscle to maintain um its current positioning um in west asia and its current positioning is also extremely bad because it is a bunch of military bases dotted around um the region where iran could strike very easily overwhelm the air, air defenses um you know destroy the u.s fighter aircraft station there um, and destroy the bases themselves. And there's not really very much the US can do about it. And be, because of their positioning, like, you know, because they're trying to contain Iran. So it's like all around, it, 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 all of these bases are like dotted around Iran. Well, that's that's five minutes for the US to launch a strike against uh, the Islamic Republic. It's also five minutes for Iran to respond. And they have the drones and the missiles and um, the uh, uh, like ballistic capabilities, the hypersonic capabilities to do that. Um, yeah. and, and, and I think that, that, yeah, there is a constant misreading here because in April, um, Iran struck Israel in what was meant to be a kind of illustrative um effort it was the 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 purpose wasn't to uh carry carry out like you know mass division casualties or just de destroy like tons of resources on the ground in tel aviv it was to show the zionist entity and their western backers if we really wanted to we could cut through all of this and destroy your country um and the yeah the the fact that there wasn't like scores of dead children i think perhaps acted as a kind of um it, it, the zionist entity didn't really take it seriously as a result like yeah. they, they kind of saw well well well, oh, well no one died so therefore it was a failure no it was it was literally they were showing um the west and israel like what they could do and it was a lot um as the october 1st strike um, demonstrated, and I think again, I mean, another um, on the subject of collapsing empire, it was very interesting that the um, yeah, that the effectively Zionist entity officials painted themselves into a corner because on the one hand they claimed that the October first strike was a um, uh, was a on a par with like Pearl Harbor. It was like this a day that will live in infamy. But then also it was just an expensive fireworks display that achieved nothing. It's right. like no, like, like they they pounded airfields from which flights, which are part the core component of the the genocide in Gaza, um, uh, 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 flew from. Um, and yeah, like like they, 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 they flattened all of that. And then again, it's just like, well, I mean, if you want to escalate further, we're going to escalate further, and it's a lot worse than we can do. And I don't think that Iran would have done that without a certainty that, well, either they won't 
escalate very seriously or if they do this will lead to a war that will win you know they are right. very cautious they are very cautious well he, here's here's the problem for israel i in my view um mm. in my unprofessional military analyst view uh israel has at the moment air superiority they fail when it comes to ground to the ground they cannot win a war against the army of hezbollah um right. So they have to rely on their air superiority. What happens when these $200 Shahid drones, which we heard about so much in the context of Ukraine, make their way to Hezbollah? Well, it's hard to argue that Israel has air superiority at that point. Um, mm. So, you know, maybe the Iron Dome can intercept, you know, 30% of the missiles shot at Tel Aviv, but you know, all these drones were they were they to come, uh, it would be much less effective, I think. So there is a great deal of trepidation, um, I imagine, happening by Israeli war policy makers. Um the other thing I'd like to say about Saudi Arabia is that uh, you know, it would be extremely beneficial for them economically to normalize relations with Israel. Uh, which they seem to be doing, uh, you know, on the verge of doing prior to October 7th of last year. Um, now they have made uh, Palestinian statehood contingent on normalizing relations with Israel. Mm. Uh, this this should not be overlooked as a major um, because Israel obviously needs it cannot be completely isolated from everything from i mean israel and russia always had good relations that's souring israel and mm. saudi arabia were working were working things out that that that's that's souring um and i think i think that anyone who is looking at this in an existential way um the problem is not iranian nukes it's it's being completely uh, a hermit kingdom, as we like to call North Korea, and just being totally cut off from everyone but the United Kingdom and the United States, uh, which are on the other side of the world. Um, so I think that they have a very, uh, a very, they're walking, they have to walk a tightrope if they're going to continue this war and not, uh, not further isolate themselves from countries like Saudi Arabia. Um, so that, I mean, mm. that's what I think. Hey everyone, um, if you enjoyed this video or, or any of our other content, uh, please give us a follow on Twitter or subscribe to us on YouTube. It will help us beat the algorithm oligarchs. Thank you.